I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to the Gospel of St. John, chapter 10. Uh, it's where we're going to be this uh, entire afternoon in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 10. I'm proud to say that in all four services, last night in the three services of today, no one's cell phone went off in the minute of silence. I was like, man, you know la raza, man. Somebody's phone's got to go off. But, but no, nope, y'all pulled through. Really proud of y'all. Anyways, um, a couple of weeks ago, we started a new series uh, studying um, the seven times in the Gospel of John where Jesus uses the phrase, I am. And, um, and today, uh, we're going to continue with that study. I did want to take a quick moment to thank those of you who made the time and the effort last week to come at the 10 a.m. service uh, to support that service where we had the Consul of Israel, General Consul of Israel, come and speak to us. And biblically speaking, it was a, it was a, a blessing to have her here, be able to pray for her and to be able to pray um, uh, over her and, and, and through her over the nation of Israel. And so I appreciate those of you who, um, who came out and supported that service. And some of you even came to two services, came to that service and, and still made it a Pueblo's church. And so I, I really appreciate that. Um, as I mentioned, today we're going to um, continue with the, uh, our, our series of I Am. And, um, and I'll share with you something real quick. Um, uh, as many of you know, we've been, uh, last year we started working with, or I think we're already going on two years, we started working with um, uh, helping out these, the immigrants that are there at the border, um, uh, more specifically in Reynosa, near Reynosa, McAllen area. And, um, and uh, I, I know I, just because of lack of time, I haven't really mentioned too much about it, but we, we continue to help them. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of stuff that we're about to send down, a lot of hygiene products we're about to send out, and, and an offering that we're going to send um, to, to help out. But um, last year, no, actually, I think it was this year, a couple of months ago, um, the pastor that we work with in Reynosa, Pastor Mauro Esquivel, came to, to Houston, came to Pasadena to pick up some stuff that I wanted to send down, and he just came to say hi and have, have lunch and stuff. And so he's like, Pastor, you know, will you give my wife and I a tour of the church? And I was like, yeah. So you know, we went through the, tour, through the radio, the school, the church, and we came to the sanctuary, and he stayed looking at the doors, and he, and he asked me, he's like, Pastor, what do those doors mean? What do they represent? And I was like, you know, Pastor, I've given so many pastors and ministers a tour of the church, even people from the church, and no one has asked me, what do those doors mean? What, what do they signify? Uh, and, um, and when we uh, remodeled uh, during COVID, um, the guys asked me, hey, do you want us to make the door like, like, you know, to seem like part of the wall, right? And I'm like, no, 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 no. I want it to look like door, doors. Like I want it to look like real doors. Um, because, and it's the study that we'll, we're on today, Jesus says, I am the door, right? Um, in the Bible that I'm going to be sharing, uh, the New Living Translation, he uses the word gate. Um, but in some of your Bibles, it says door. In Spanish, it says puerta, which puerta is door. And so Jesus says, I am the door. And that's what we're going to be studying today. Let's open up our Bibles to John chapter 10. And uh, we'll, we'll start reading with verse 1. John chapter 10, verse 1. I'll tell you the truth, anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold, rather than going through the door, must surely be a thief and a robber. But the one who enters through the door, through the gate, is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate, the door for him, and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he has gathered his flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. In the portion of Scripture that we're going to be studying this afternoon, Jesus speaks about three groups of people, or three people. Uh, he talks about um, the sheep. We're the sheep. He talks about the thief, and the thief is the devil, is Satan, or however you want to call him, Lucifer, the father of lies. And then he talks about the good shepherd, and the good shepherd, the shepherd, is Jesus himself, right? So we've got the sheep, we've got the thief, and we've got the shepherd. 
And, and the shepherd has a voice. The shepherd speaks. And the sheep, the flock, hear that voice, know the voice, recognize the voice, and follow the shepherd. Now, I'm going to tell you something that should, should scare us, but, but many in the church, and I'm not just talking about Pueblo's church, I'm just talking about church in general. Many in the church do not know or do not recognize the voice of the shepherd. They don't know it. They don't recognize it. Years ago, there was a, 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 a guy who we were good friends, uh, and he used to come to our church, and um, his uh, girlfriend had this little puppy, and the mom was like, you need to get rid of that dog. So he knew I like dogs. And he's like, hey, man, will, will you take this dog off my hands? And so he brought me this little puppy, and, and um, the dog, was, he looked like a little lion. And so I named him Tiger. Right. And well, man, he was little, but he just kept growing and growing and growing and growing. He was a, a, a German shepherd mix. And so I had this big dog named Tiger and I used to just have him loose. Like my parents have no gate, no fence at the house. And so Tiger, he would just run the neighborhood loose. And um, and so yeah, I would come out and I would just whistle. I would whistle like that. But I mean, loud, louder than that. You know, I just didn't whistle so loud because your ears were hurt. But I mean, I would whistle. And all of a sudden. Do, 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 do. You would just hear those paws like, Poof. and here would come Tiger running and he'd come home. One day, Tiger and I, we were out, you know, walking the neighborhood and uh, uh, there's uh, some neighbors that live across the street from my parents. They're like, is that your dog? And I go, yeah, that, that's Tiger. Tiger's my dog. And they're like, oh man, um, we call him Bullet. And I'm like, Bullet? And they're like, yeah, every day Bullet comes into the garage while we're watching TV and he sits down and watches TV with us. And then he goes, and then you'll whistle and he'll get up and pew, like a bullet will take off running to the house. And he goes, so we call him Bullet. And I go, well, that's funny. His name is Tiger. And Tiger responded to both Bullet and Tiger. How do you like that, right? <laughs> the thing is that when I would whistle, Tiger or Bullet, Tiger recognized the call of his shepherd, right? The call of his Lord, right? And so he would come running to where I was at. I'm going to tell you that, that there, are, there are voices and, and we need to listen because in the midst of all the voices that are out there, there is the voice of your shepherd that is calling you. And, and the way that you and I begin to hear the voice of the shepherd and begin to distinguish the voice of the shepherd is that we, we, we hear that voice in the preaching. We hear that voice in the teaching. We hear that voice in the middle of praise and worship. We hear that voice when we come uh, and are gathered with, with, the, with the flock, with the believers. We hear that voice when we are in prayer. We hear that voice when we read the scriptures. And the more you hear it, the more you will recognize the voice of the shepherd, right? And you'll be able to distinguish it in the midst of the noise and the other voices that are out calling us. Now, I like verse seven, I mean, verse six, because verse six says, those who heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant. Now, there were people present and Jesus talked about the thief and about the shepherd and about the sheep, the flock. And, and there were people that didn't understand. And I read it and I kind of chuckle. I'm like, because most of us, you know, we're born and raised here in the suburbs or in the city. And we've never dealt with sheep and goats and these type of things and shepherds and being out. And so it's hard for us to understand. I remember, uh, I was remembering, especially in last service, um, the young lady that's helping us with, with, with the screens, um, her father and her uncle, uh, they were, before they were married, you know, they were, they were the young men here at our church. And, and I remember Christmas time and summer vacation, they would always invite me to El Rancho. Come on, Ruben, vamos al rancho. You know, let's go to El Rancho, El Rancho. And, and, and those of you that are from Mexico know that El Rancho in Mexico is very different than a ranch here in the United States, right? Like El Rancho in Mexico is, is like a village. It's like a town. And, um, and, and so I, I never went. I regret that I never went. Um, I, I wish I would have. But um, anyways, when we think of, of, of farming and we think of cattle, you know, we think of ranches, we think of barbed wire, we think of fences. But when we go back 2,000 years ago to what Jesus is talking about, there were shepherds and they were out in open fields. I mean, where there was grass for the sheep to eat, the shepherd would take the flock. 
where there was water for the sheep to drink, the shepherd would take the flock. Right? At night, the, the shepherd would have to look around and find a safe place, a safe spot, and, and say, hey, look, we're going to gather the flock there. Sometimes it was in a cave, and so they would gather the flock inside of a cave and, and protect the flock from the elements of, of the weather or, or from thieves, as Jesus spoke about, or maybe some wild animal like a, like a, a bear or a lion or, 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 or a wolf. Sometimes there wasn't a cave, and so they would have to find some rocks and some branches and, and build something where they could stick the, the sheep in, the flock in, but there was always an opening. And at the opening, oftentimes, the shepherd would lay at the opening, at the door or at the gate. Verse 7 says, so he explained it to them, and he said, I tell you the truth, I am the door for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. I'm the door. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and we will find good pastures. Jesus not only describes himself as the shepherd or the good shepherd, he describes himself as the gate or as the door, as many of your Bibles say. The sheep must pass through the door. Not only does the sheep must pass through the door, if the, the door is there at the entrance, if, if Jesus is the, the shepherd who is the door guarding the entrance, when the wild animals would come to the cave, they would have to go through the door, through the shepherd. When the thieves or the robbers would come to steal, they would have to go through the door, go through the shepherd. And in our case, the shepherd has a name, and his name is Jesus Christ. I remember... Uh, Years ago, I, I used to uh, go with, with, with my father, and those of you who come to Spanish service know um, Julio, who usually leads worship. Julio and I, we used to go with my dad to a bunch of different funerals, and we used to take our guitars, and we would sing a couple of songs, and then my dad would preach or minister. Uh, so I used to play saxophone. Sometimes I would take my saxophone, play Amazing Grace or something, and, and then my dad would preach or minister. Sometimes I would just go with my dad and help him with water or just go support him. And uh, I remember one of the last funerals that my dad ministered at, he, he was ministering, and right here, like right next to him, was a door. And, and he was ministering, and then suddenly he said, he says, you know, when someone dies, death is not the end. It's like going through that door. It's like leaving here and going into there. The last two years, 2020 and 2021, were, were hard on many of our families, many of our loved ones. We have families present in this service that lost a loved one. They passed through that door. Now there's two doors. One door, one gate is wide and many pass through it and it leads to destruction. Or maybe you know it as hell. The other door, the other gate is narrow and few go through it but it leads to eternal life, to the kingdom of God, or what we would call heaven. Thank God for our loved ones that knew the door was Jesus. And when it came time to go through that door, they went through the correct door, which is the presence of the Lord. Right? Two doors, two gates. Verse 7 says, so he explained it to them. He said, I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. Verse 9, he says, yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me, everybody together, will be saved. Once again, those who come in through me will be saved. Let's go to verse 19, verse 19. When he said these things, the people were again divided in their opinions about him. As someone said, verse 20, 
He's demon possessed and out of his mind. Why listen to a man like that? Right? So Jesus says, hey, he doesn't say I am a gate. He doesn't say I am a door. He says, I am the gate. I am the door. And whoever passes through me shall be saved. And there were people that were bothered by this. They, there was dissent over this. And let me tell you that we fast forward 2,000 years and here we are in the year 2022. And there are still people who are, who are bothered by the fact that Jesus says, I am the gate. I am the door. There's a, a, a philosophy, a false doctrine that has entered into some churches. Last Saturday, I wasn't able to make it a service, and, and uh, Heber, Daniel, uh, sorry, I was uh, uh, ministered, and I got to listen to a little bit of, of his preaching while I was on the road. And he brought up something that I often bring, of, um, bring up, of, of uh, Oprah Winfrey, and uh, m many of you have hold, heard of Oprah. Oh, right. <laughs> And she, she preaches this false doctrine, this philosophy. And, and, and unfortunately, I'll put, I'll put in quotes, air quotes, there are many Christian churches that preach this false doctrine called universalism. And the way that many describe universalism is that they'll say, like, look, look, it doesn't really matter what you believe. God is on top of a mountain and all the faiths are just different paths, different ways to reach the same destination, which is the presence of God. You think? You think? 2,000 years ago, the creator of the universe, the invisible, took on flesh and became visible. And as we learned when, on Mother's Day, we studied and we saw that in Egypt, in the days of Moses, the most vulnerable that someone could be is to be a newborn baby. It's the most vulnerable uh, uh, position that a person is in in their lifetime is to be a newborn. And, and the creator of the universe came and became the most vulnerable amongst us, became a newborn. I mean, look at what's going on today. 2022, there are people protesting, literally fighting, throwing fists, big money, billions of dollars trying to protect the right to destroy the most vulnerable amongst us, a baby in the womb. 2022, with all the technology, with all the science that we have, with, with these sonograms and 3D imaging, where they can see these little hands, these little feet, legs, arms, necks. Hey, I remember we were doing a sonogram with Rebecca Rose, and the doctor said, oh my goodness, she has a lot of hair. You could see her hair. I mean, that's the technology, where they can see the heartbeat, where they can see if the brain is, fun is, is developing correct or not with all, I mean you look at that image you're like that's a person yet there are people today fighting for the right to murder that person and, and, and some of you may not even know this they're not just fighting for the right to murder that person in the womb they're now fighting for the right to murder that person outside of the womb to where a woman can give birth and after giving birth say you know now that I think about it I changed my mind and they're fighting for the right to destroy that living person, not only in the womb, but after birth. So here's the creator of the universe, comes to be the most vulnerable amongst us, a newborn baby. And if you know the story, you know his family had to flee because they wanted to kill him in that state. And they laid him, they laid him in a manger. We're a manger. That's, that's, where, that's where the sheep and the, the cows come and eat. And if you've ever worked around sheep or goats or, or cows, when it comes to feeding time, it's all drool. I mean, they laid the king of the universe in nothing but drool. And then he suffered. He lived a life of suffering. The life of Jesus here on earth was a life of suffering. The Gospels say that he came to his own, yet his own rejected him. One of his close friends sold him out for a few pieces of silver. 
One of his closest friends three times denied him. He was arrested. He was beaten. They pulled on his beard. They put a crown of thorns on him. They, they beat him. They whooped him. They scourged him. They almost left him for dead. They disrobed him. They had him naked. They crucified him. And he died a slow and painful death on the cross. You think that our Heavenly Father permitted all of these things to happen to his son so that 2,000 years later we can say, eh, I believe in Jesus, but if you don't want to believe in Jesus, it's okay as long as you're a good person. As long as you're spiritual, as long as you really take your faith in a sincere way, it doesn't really matter because we're all going to end up in the same place. That's illogical. That makes no sense whatsoever. No. I don't mean to offend anyone, but I'm here to speak the truth. And the truth is that there is only one way, one life, one way to the presence of God, and his name is Jesus Christ. There's only one good shepherd, there's only one gate, and his name is Jesus Christ. Que se molesten los que se van a molestar. Those are going to be bothered, let them be bothered. We're here to proclaim the truth, because it is the truth that shall set us free. There's only one way into the presence of God. And his name is Jesus Christ. There's only one life. I know that uh, while well, I live an alternative lifestyle, I could care less about your alternative lifestyle. There's only one life that leads us to the presence of the Father. And it is the life of serving his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Verse 10. The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. My purpose is to give you a rich and satisfying life. Some of your Bibles say the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and life more abundantly. There is a spiritual battle going on. There is a spiritual battle going on in our country. There's a spiritual battle going on in our state. There is a spiritual battle going on in our community. There is a spiritual battle going on in our churches. There is a spiritual battle going on in our families, in our homes. And that spiritual battle is between the thief and the shepherd. The thief doesn't come to play around. The thief isn't coming to play patty cake with you. The thief isn't coming to play games with you. The thief's sole purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. Thank God that God has sent us a Savior. And the Savior, the Good Shepherd, has a purpose. And his purpose is to give you life and life more abundantly. A rich and satisfying life. And let me tell you that there's a spiritual battle going on. Many years ago, there used to be, I used to teach Wednesday nights in a young men's uh, class. It was a teen, teenage boy class that we used to have here on Wednesday nights at the Royal Rangers. And, um, and I remember one day I was teaching and I had these young men that were sitting like, you know, like a half circle in front of me and, and I was teaching and there was this one particular uh, uh, kid and he was sitting next to this column that, that was present in the room. And, uh, and, and I was ministering and all of a sudden, while ministering, I just kind of picked up my hand and I pointed at him. I, and I don't even know why. I, I guess prompting from the Holy Spirit or something. And I pointed at him and I said, there's a spiritual battle going on for your soul right now and you're losing. And when I picked up my hand, as I picked up my hand, he, he bowed his head so he didn't see me point at him. So I just kept on teaching. A few minutes later, again, I picked up my hand, pointed right at him, and I said, there's a spiritual battle going on for your soul right now, and you're losing. And when I picked up my hand, he, he, he put his head down, and he didn't even know that I was talking to him. And the other kids, they're just looking like, what in the world? This happened about three or four times. Last night, in last night's service, there was a, a young man in that service that was present, he, and he, he's a witness to the story that I'm telling you. After I taught, I told the young man to get up. And, and he was leaning against the column, and, and I said, let's pray before we're dismissed. And I started praying. And in the middle of my prayer, I began to raise my hand and point at him. And as I was raising my hand, he stood behind the column. And I pointed at him and I said, right now there's a spiritual battle going on for your soul. And you are losing. And as I put my hand down, he came out from around that column. 
He never knew I was talking about him. The whole time, all the other boys are like eyes bugged out, mouths open, just looking like, like what is going on? There is a spiritual battle going on. And I hate to say this, but many in the church are losing. Many in the church are losing. We see what just happened four hours from here down south. A little town called Uvalde. And the reaction, the response of people in the church leaves me mind boggling. People say, oh, we need to pass a law. You think, you think a law? Man, I don't want to get political. But first of all, he took a gun to a school. That's illegal. There's even a sign that says, gun-free zone. That's illegal. He broke the law. He murdered 19 kids, two adults. I mean, we live in Texas. We still have the death penalty. Breaking a law that's, that, that the consequences, the death penalty, did not stop him. And then you've got some clown political figure saying, vote for me, vote for me, and this wouldn't have happened. There's a spiritual battle going on. There's a spiritual battle going on. And then, you know, look on social media, look at the hermanos. Thoughts and prayers for Uvalde. Thoughts and prayers for Uvalde. Hey, I'm all for thoughts and prayers for Uvalde, but my question is, are you really praying? Some of us are posting thoughts and prayers for Uvalde, but we ain't spent not two minutes on our knees praying for Uvalde. Makes, I'm not getting after you. I'm just speaking truth. Don't get all offended. Some of y'all look like you're about to cry. It's okay. <laughs> got the like, got the comment. Amen. We ain't praying. The church is not praying. I'm pretty much here every Saturday morning, and I tell you, it's not just like Iglesia del Pueblo, but it's 99% of churches across America, the least attended service is prayer meeting. We ain't praying. We're not people of prayer. I, I know that two, two or three of you are like, well, pastor, I pray four hours a day. I know, thank you, thank you. Don't forget to pray for your pastor. But as a whole, as a whole, the church in America, the church in America ain't praying. We're voting more than we're praying. We're fighting for Trump or fighting for Biden more than what we're praying. We're putting our faith and our confidence in some law or something more than what we are actually praying. There's a spiritual battle going on. And that spiritual battle is not fought in the ballots. It's not fought in the voting booth. Now, I encourage you all to vote and vote your faith. But that's not where the spiritual battle is fought, and that's not where the spiritual battle is won. The spiritual battle is fought and won when we are attentive to the voice of the Good Shepherd, when we are willing to walk through the gate, through the door of the Good Shepherd, when we spend time on our knees before the Good Shepherd praying, interceding, and advocating for our families, for our church, for our community, for our state, and for our nation. That's where the spiritual battle is won. That's where the spiritual battle is fought and won when we're in prayer. So if you posted thoughts in prayer, I'm expecting you to spend this week time on your knees actually praying. And I see, I see hermanos Ministros, pastors, criticizing others for putting thoughts in prayer. I, I saw a pastor put on social media, we don't need thoughts in prayers. We need to do something. Excuse me? Excuse me? You don't think prayer is doing something? You must not understand that there is a spiritual battle going on and we don't fight against flesh and blood, but we fight 
in the air against principalities, against powers, against darkness. And that fought, that fight is fought in prayer. James chapter 5, verse 16 says, the earnest prayer of a righteous man has great power and produces wonderful results. When I see a pastor say, we don't need thoughts in prayer. I think to myself, he must not be a righteous man. And surely his prayers must not have power because the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. We need to be in prayer. Right? We need to be in prayer. Verse 7, once again. Chapter 10, verse 7. I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. Verse 9. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. And then let's go to um, verse they won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. Years ago, there was a, uh, a considerable friend of mine who was working with us. His name was uh, Memo. And uh, one day, uh, Memo was telling me, he's like, he like, my dad called and, and told me that my uncle took a false door. I'm like, what? He told me in Spanish, he's like, Mi tío pasó por una puerta falsa. I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like, my, my uncle killed himself, committed suicide. He went through a false door. Jesus says, I am the door. You and I, we have to understand that there are false doors. False doors. Yeah. You've been married 20 years. Your kids have grown up and, and they're all out of the house. And, and all of a sudden, you know, you're thinking like, I don't know if this is for me. I don't know if this marriage is for me or not. And you're thinking of, of separating or getting a divorce. That's a false door. You have these thoughts and feelings of, of, of maybe harming yourself or taking your life. Let me tell you, that would be a false door. There are these false doors that, that present around us. Not only are there false doors, but there are false voices. False voices. Maybe you're hearing voices that, that trigger depression in you. It's a false voice. Maybe you're hearing a voice that triggers anxiety in you. It's a false voice. Maybe you're hearing a voice that's telling you, harm yourself or, or give up. That's a false voice. Maybe there's a, a door or a voice that, that is trying to uh, sway you from following the good shepherd, from walking with the Lord. Let me tell you, that's a false door and it's a false voice. Ignore it. Avoid it. Don't fall for the trap. I, I was remembering in these services that uh, years ago, uh, this girl found a box of puppies and somehow through a mutual friend or whatever, I ended up with one of those puppies. I still have the dog. Her name is Amira. And when I first moved into the house that I lived in, I, and I first got a mirror, she's little, she's so cute. And, and, um, and, and, and the house that I live in the, had this fence, and the fence was short, falling down and stuff like that. And, um, and so I used to let a mirror loose in the backyard. And, and one, one day, uh, one evening, it was night, she's loose, and, and I, was, I was leaning against the back door at the porch, just looking at her, use the restroom, and, um, and so she would use the restroom, and I'd be whistle, come on in, girl, and so she, she would come in. This one particular night, uh, I let her out there, and, and she's out there, the sun hadn't fully gone down, so there's still a little bit of light, and, and there was this guy who was tall, he was a tall, big guy, and he's passing by, and he saw her, and she was so cute, I mean, she's still pretty, but she was so cute when she was a puppy, and he leaned over the fence, <clears throat> and, and he reaches down, and I'm just leaning against the door, just, just looking at him, and, um, and he starts, <laughs> come here, girl, come here, girl. And, and so I'm just, I'm just leaning against the door, just, just side eye. <laughs> and, 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 and Amira takes, takes a couple of steps. 
gets near him, but before she goes with him, she stops and she turns around and looks at me. And I guess the way she did it, the guy lifted up his head and saw me. And, and, and the whole time I'm just lean and, you know, just, just, you know, squinty eye, you know what I mean? And he looks at me, he's like, oh, I I'm sorry, sir, I'm sorry. He goes, it's just that she was so cute. I just wanted to pet her, I promise, I just wanted to pet her. I was like, mm-hmm. Keep walking, amigo, keep walking, right? Keep walking, amigo, keep walking. What's that false voice that's, come here, come here, come here. Right? Oh, let me tell you, it's important that we would know and hear and understand and be able to distinguish the voice of the shepherd because there are false voices out there that are calling you. Let me tell you that it's important that you and I would be able to know and distinguish which is the correct door, which is the door of the shepherd, the gate. Because when you go through that door, when you go through that gate, you know that when the thief comes, he too has to pass through that gate. When the lion comes, he too will have to pass through that gate. Ah, uh ah. -uh. My dad, and when he would minister in Spanish, he would talk about golpes de la vida. And golpes de la vida, translated in English, is life's blows. Man, let me tell you, life, boom, life, life, life throws, throws some stuff at us. 20 years marriage, 25 years marriage, and all of a sudden your husband says, I just don't love you. Like, pow, man, that was, a, that was a blow gave you right there. You're working, I mean, it happened for some of our people, working here at, at Lindale, had a good job, thought everything's going well, and all of a sudden they tell you, well, they're going to close the, the, the uh, refinery, we're not sure you're going to have a job or not, pow, there's another, another life blow world thrown at you. Or you raised your kids, bringing them to the spot, bringing them to Sunday school. And, and you know, now they're in high school, they're seniors, they're about to graduate. And man, you know, uh, past month, every Friday and Saturday night, they're showing up drunk. And you didn't raise them like that. Pow, pow. Life's just throwing some blows at you. You went to the doctor to regular checkup and he saw something he didn't like and he said, we, we need to analyze. You know what? We're going to send you to a specialist. All of a sudden that specialist calls and says, mm, that, that, little, that little dot you had on you is benign. It's, it, you know, it's cancerous. Pow, another punch, another blow. The biggest, hardest blow that life throws at us is death. Death. The creator of the universe came to this world, became like us, a man. And man, life just gave him pow, pow, pow. One time someone came and told Jesus, Jesus, I'll follow you. Jesus said, I don't even have a place to rest my head. I don't even have a pillow to rest my head. Boom. Came to his own and his own did not receive him. Pow. Arrested, beaten, disrobed, scourged, crucified, pow, pow, pow. Betrayal of a friend, the denial of another friend, pow, pow. A slow, horrible death on the cross, pow. I don't know how many boxing fans I have here, but you know when that knockout punch happens and that other boxer falls, the referee jumps in and the referee starts to count. One. Two, three, counts all the way up to 10. If he reaches 10, defeated, he's the victor. Pow, hardest punch life can give is death. They buried him in a cave, in, in a tomb. And I'm sure that there was a count. One, two, but when they got to three, on the third day, God rose him up. And today, the gate, the door tells you, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he may be dead, shall live. Oh, there is victory in Jesus Christ. And in Jesus, you are more than victorious. <laughs> Choose the right door. Listen to the voice that is calling you. Ignore the false voices that are calling out to you. It's important. It's 
important. I don't know how, how many of the past, how many people in the past three services needed healing because of the false voices that are rising up in their ears. Needed healing because in one moment or another they had chosen a false door. But today there is healing for you, but you must choose the right door. You must choose the right gate. You must choose the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except through me. Choose Jesus. Choose Jesus. It would be the best decision that you can ever make. In this moment, I, I want to invite you to close your Bibles and possible bow your head and Start thanking God that you came today. Thank, thank the Lord that you came to church today. Father, I thank you that I came to church. Lord, Lord, Lord I, I thank you that I'm here. If your family is here, what a blessing. Thank the Lord that your family is here with you. Father, I thank you that my mom is here, my, my nieces are here. I thank you that my sister and my nephews are here, Father. Father, I thank you that my family was able to come to the services today. Will you thank the Father that he's here? Say, Father, thank you that you're here. True to your word, dwell in our praises. Jesus, true to your word, two or three gathered in your name, you're there. Holy Spirit, always with us, always with the church. Thank you that you're here with us. Is there anyone present today that says, I need to walk through the door that is Jesus Christ? I need to respond to that voice of the good shepherd. I need safety. I need security. And we only find it through the one who conquered death, Jesus Christ. And, and if today you say, I need, I need to walk through that door. Will you just raise your hand? You raise your hand and then you can put it down. I see you. God bless you. I see you on my left, in the middle, on the right. I see you in the balcony. God bless you. You know what? Like I always say, bigger than me seeing you, God sees you. God sees you. The enemy is coming to steal, kill, and destroy. The thief wants to steal, kill, and destroy. He's like a lion looking for who to devour. He's out there roaring. But Jesus is your gate. And to get to you, he must go through Jesus. And Jesus has already conquered him and has already conquered death. You have victory. I want to invite everyone in this moment. Let's, let's pray together. Repeat this prayer with me. Just pray with me. Say, Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that before me is the good shepherd who is the door, Jesus Christ. Today, I choose to walk through that door. So I confess with my mouth what I believe in my heart. Your son, Jesus Christ. He is Lord. He is master. He is king. And I believe with all my heart that he died on the cross and he was buried. But three days later, you resurrected him. And because I confess and believe this, you promised me salvation. And with salvation, you promised me new life, eternal life, and abundant life a rich and satisfying life. And I receive it in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord some praise.